Okay, hello and welcome to our Halloween episode um, where we look at Halloween and what this holiday might mean for the animals associated with Halloween. Um, so my name's Chris and I'm a PhD student from Exeter University studying cat-human relationships in urban environments um, and social discourses surrounding free roaming cats. Hi, my name's Sarah. I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter and I've just started this year and my project will be um, human shock uh, interactions with specifically looking at um, shark listener uh, relationships. Hi, I'm Lisa. Uh, I graduated from uh, University of Exeter and through Zoology Masters, I think it was 2017, which shows how awful my memory is. Um, and my uh, day job is in uh, cat welfare in the UK. Hi, my name is Kathy. <laughs> I'm a, um, I am a council member at a cat refuge in Italy uh, for 10 years now. I have a BA in cultural anthropology and I did attend the MA uh, program in anthrozoology at Exeter, uh, which I'm applying now uh, at the cat shelter and I will be speaking about black cats today. Hi everyone, my name is Jimmy and I am a jack of all trades really, uh, but birds of prey are my thing, so I think today I'm talking about owls um, and their role possibly in Halloween, uh, but I'm also a, yeah, I completed the MA in anthrozoology at Exeter, I think the same as Lisa, was it 2017? I'm Michelle Sidlowski, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter and I also teach at Beacon College in Leesburg, Florida. And my study focuses on captive elephant welfare and human elephant relations in Nepal. Okay, so the tradition of Halloween is believed to have originated from the ancient Celtic tradition of Samhain. Um, and this is where people would light bonfires and wear costumes to ward off the spirits of the dead. Um, because on this day, it was the last day of the year and the veil between the living and the dead was, um, was thin. Um, but then it was in the 8th century, Pope Gregory III designated November 1st as the time to honour all saints. Um, and all saints incorporated some of the traditions of um, San Juan. Um, so the evening before was known as All Hallows Eve, um, which later became Halloween. Um, and over time, Halloween evolved into a day of fun activities like trick-or-treating, um, jack-o'-lantern carving, or as I call them, pumpkin heads. Um, festive gatherings, dressing up, and of course, eating candy, my favorite part. Um, so none of us are historians, but we'll share a couple of references in the credits. Um, and one source that I read was this book by Lisa Norton um, called Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween. Uh, so like most holidays, Halloween has been subjected to increased commercialization in capitalist societies. Um, but today, Halloween festivities are popular with children um, and young adults um, who both like to dress up and party. Um, and today we're going to be discussing um, uh, Halloween animals. So that is animals traditionally associated with Halloween um, and what this might mean for those animals. Um, so to me, Halloween seems to be about taking the things we fear as society and confronting them through fun activities. Um, but I wonder how much we create fear and prejudice in children by presenting certain animals um, as something to fear. Um, so I guess the question I'm going to throw out to, to whoever wants to, to start off is um, how are anim animal representations used and consumed um, during the festivities and what, what impact might this have on, on real animals? Um, well, I can start off with pumpkins. <laughs> You mentioned pumpkins, okay, not an animal, that is very true. But uh, apparently in the UK, 8 million pumpkins are thrown away after Halloween every year. Um, and I don't know that if you've seen, but um, there's often on social media, lots of rescue centres then post pictures of, of animals uh, being given pumpkins um, as a treat or as enrichment um, after uh after Halloween, because of all these pumpkins that are, um, are, are left over. Has anybody else seen that? At the Denver Zoo, they, uh, they have a contest for the biggest pumpkin, and then that pumpkin is given to the elephants. So they always have a gigantic pumpkin smashing event. Mm. Elephants actually smash it up, do they? Mm -hmm. They step on it. <laughs> do they seem to enjoy that? 
They do. And actually, pumpkin in Asia is a pretty common uh, thing to offer to elephants. Okay. Hmm. Pumpkins in the UK are quite a recent introduction for Halloween. So certainly, I think, from probably American popular culture. Um, and far harder to carve. I seem to remember the likes of Swedes yes. or beet. Um, so smaller, far smaller than a pumpkin, and far less colourful. But if you if you were going to sort of do, yeah, they would they get they would get carved. Um, so it's almost like we've done imported the pumpkin for Halloween, but not the presumably cooking that goes around. You know, people using it as an everyday day ingredient. Um, and I think with the animals and the wildlife, I've seen recently the, the warnings about people, oh, what was it, that they're coating the outside of the pumpkin to make it last longer. Um, but that's then the risk is that it's toxic to, to, to wildlife. So that even that potential then to sort of reuse it in some way, you know, people might do that thinking, yay, the, the lantern's going to last a lot longer. But then, the, yeah, the toxicities may well be there. And apologies, I can't quite recall what the what the what the the, the outer coating is, but it is yeah, people are doing that. Apparently, one of the the big um, problems with it is is uh, the the um, the addition to climate change with so much food being wasted, uh, like a third of food that uh, a third of food in the in the UK, I believe, is is actually food waste um, bought bought for human consumption and then thrown away. But um, I mean. In, ter in terms of, um, uh, I, I was talking before about um, zoos and, pe and people giving pumpkins to um, zoos for animal enrichment. I found a study on um, one uh, zoo which actually scared zoo animals with Halloween masks to, um, to see if they had uh, any response to different faces. And maybe possibly surprisingly, they they said that the greatest um, the greatest uh, the the animals that were most scared in the the way that they measured it were primates, um, but they said that other animals as well like deer. Um, uh, uh, what else did they have? Macaws, deer, etc. Then they had that some had some reaction as well. But uh, when we do boo at the zoo, which is the uh, children's event. They actually close the feline building because the felines don't like the different patterns of the costumes and the masks. And then they close the primate house as well for that reason. The primates you know, respond to the different faces a lot more easily. Do you find that, Jimmy, with owls and your when you go to Halloween events with your with your birds? Um, well, I don't I don't do any work with captive birds anymore. Um, but I know there are there's people that, that host events using owls, and I think that's probably more linked into the, the Harry Potter um, environment as well, because they're inevitably dressed up as, as a, um, a character from Harry Potter as well. But I've seen a few people this year doing photo shoots with, with owls, uh, but obviously these owls are, are, are conditioned, you know, they're, they're hand-reared and conditioned to see a, a whole host of, weird and wonderful things so um so yeah i've not i've not known of any being terrified by voldemort or, or whoever i'm trying to think of scary characters in harry potter um so so yeah I, I, it was never something that i really got involved with it was all a bit that sort of thing was a bit too gimmicky for me really with, with birds so. but i've seen uh, yeah photo shoots sort of scenarios uh, I've seen that this year. So has any of your research on uh, the way that anim um, birds reacted in, um, you know, with people at, at certain events? Not really, but in interestingly, um, I'm just, I, I didn't mention it when I introduced myself, but I'm, I'm looking at start potentially starting a, a PhD uh, at, uh, not at Exeter, sadly, um, but uh, looking at understanding owls and their their sort of not that not so much their behaviours, but their signalling. So obviously, if you think of 
uh, an owl. There's obviously over, just over 200 species, but you know the feather tuft on the top of the head that people consider as ears. They, they we know that that they will they will use them to show what potentially mood they're in, and um, their eyes and and the the different colorations of facial discs. Some have more than others. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna look at maybe running a PhD on that, which then I would like to then develop it into um, a, a part of the PhD. I'd like to look at using what we understand about owls and how they express themselves as a, wel a welfare way of looking at better welfare standards for owls in captivity. Uh, yeah, but I don't think really there's not really been anything done. There's been there's been lots of individual things done like looking at the feather tufts or or looking at the the, the different colours of their eyes and but, but nothing's been completely compiled altogether. So we'll see. Watch this space. Well, back to your uh, festivals, you know, I, I think it's interesting that we talk about these animals that have sort of a bad reputation now or that are treated badly at Halloween. But if we think about it, the original festivals uh, where the Druids would burn, you know, large piles of live animals for ceremonies, I think we've progressed a long way since then. <laughs> at least now we're just representing them in uh, questionable ways as opposed to burning them alive. Well, it's, it's actually, it's interesting you should mention um, about burning animals alive because uh, if, uh, owls in general uh, are absolutely, I mean, you could, you could probably write several PhDs or, or you could spend your life investigating folklore and mythology when it comes to owls. But one, I, I was just reading some stuff before and, and owls, we tend to, you can think of owls in one of two ways, really. There's the bad omen that, that people see them as, and that tends to be in a lot of cultures in Africa, for instance, um, Asia as well. Um, but then if, in a Western world, we've kind of, not advanced, but but there's, there's other reasons which I might come, in, come on to as to why they are seen in a positive light. So a good example of that is the Greeks, obviously goddess Athena, you know, owls were seen as wise and that's one of the theories behind the, the wisdom of owls. But going back to Africa, I never, I've, I've experienced firsthand to some extent, um, a, a lady was watching one of my displays, my bird displays many years ago, and she was from, I want to say Zimbabwe, I think, um, and she came up to me afterwards, and she, she and I, I think I had an owl on my hand, and and she said, in 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 my country, you would never, in a, you would never stand this close to an owl because they were seen as as an ill omen, basically, and they would be, you know, they would be chased out, they'd be stoned, but one of the things they would do was um, they would try and catch the owl and. This is horrible, sorry, but they would try and catch the owl, cover it in paraffin, and, and burn it alive, um, because that that was their way of way of dealing with that that bad omen to get rid of it was fire was a way of was a way of disposing of it. So, and I believe that sort of things to some extent. I read a read about an incident where an owl flew into a hospital in I forget which part of Africa it was in 1997 something like that um so not a million not a long time ago and there was absolute pandemonium and the owl actually ended up getting stoned to death um so there's still that, that belief but yeah you're talking about burning owls alive i i imagine that probably does still take place in some rural parts of, of africa yeah well, i was just going to say that some of the one of the books that i read uh was saying that the reason we as humans have issues with things like bats and owls is just that we don't have day-to-day -day exposure. We're, we see pigeons on a daily basis. We see seagulls, we see dogs, we see cats. But the fact that owls and bats are, are active at night when we're not running around, or at least we don't see clearly, is one of the reasons that they, they've developed this stigma is just a lack of understanding of the animal. Um, so what about what about black cats? Where where does that come from, and why are we still? Um, so I grew up in the UK in the Midlands, and I remember a black cat crossing your path was considered lucky. And then I moved to the US, bad luck. And I think in most parts of the world, a black cat crossing your path is bad luck. But I, I'm, I'm I'm curious to learn more about the the black cat um, 
superstition. Lisa. The one that I the one that I found, and I, I can sh again share the reference for you is a, a book which is called Puffs in Books, and it's just sort of little snippets of cats and literature. Um, and in there, they mentioned that during between the, the 13th and 17th centuries, um, the uh, the relationship between church and cat became more far more antagonistic so this was the catholic church um and in where were we uh 12 yeah 1233 to the point that it was almost you know risk of uh, trying to exterminate them from mainland europe um from the continent um and there was a decree that black cats were identified uh, with satan by pope gregory the ninth bless him um, and uh, yeah, so over 300 years, the yeah, millions of cats were then tortured and killed, along with their normally their female uh, companions. Um, but that, um, so re reading it through, that, that was sort of very much where, um, as this book put it, the, called it the Church of Rome. Mm -hmm. um, that the further I suppose you got across the Roman Empire, that 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 belief that absolute buy-in that cats were were satan personified particularly black ones had was was sort of less um upheld um and uh, just sort of mentioned there and far less in rural areas where that benefit of of, of cats uh for um uh rodent control you know protection of crops um so that wasn't sort of it sort of didn't that didn't translate across all of the stretch of, uh, of the Catholic Church but that was that was the link that I found with black cats in particular. But um, why, why black though? Why, why have we got a thing about black? Is it because they look the same colour as night or is it? Yeah it's the I think reading back through and it, and it goes with owls and the same with bats it seems to be a blurring the line between hu humans, people and animals so that those animals were seen to be the um, the, tran the the potential tra for transformation into their familiars, um, and the fact then that that yeah the owls are nocturnal, bats are nocturnal, and black cats are seen to be creatures of the night as well. That kind of that crepuscular activity of evenings and mornings, you know, that's you'd say that you know if a witch was out flying overnight a black cat being returning to a house of a morning would be, you know, that would be the witch's familiar, you know, that, that's the witch. Um, so I think, I think, you know, Jimmy would probably say something about that. It's, it's that, it's a creature of the night. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to make a point that on what Michelle had said before, there's a fantastic book um, called Birds and People by Mark Cocker. And it's a, it's a big, big chunky book. Um, but he, he makes exactly the same. Um, reference towards how if you look at an if you ask a lot of people about why they why they like owls for instance or what draws you to an owl it's that very human-like face you know the forward-facing eyes big eyes flat face you know mm -hmm. it, it holds you and a lot of people will comment how owls are very cat-like as well, or vice versa. I mean, I'm looking at that cat picture behind Lisa's head there. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, I talked about the ear tufts, the ears on the cat there, and the big forward face and eyes. Um, and yeah, Mark Cocker makes the point of how it's almost like it's an owl, an owl or a cat is certainly in this case, an owl is, is something you're drawn to, but it's almost like that, that transgression between human-like but then get ghouls and vampires and stuff that are again are human like, but they're they're scary. They're, they're you know, and then obviously the link to, to night and nocturnal activities. So so yeah, I, I completely agree with that and what Mark Mark Cocker and then Lisa's just mentioned. I think that maybe Lisa on another key point that is the usefulness of these animals too, that the reason that they were more accepted in rural areas is because they were more useful. To humans and animals like bats are, you know, feared in a lot of countries, um, but not in China. And that is because in China they're they're useful to humans in a lot of different ways, um, in medicinal practices and as food. I mean, bats are the highest in protein of all of the bushmeats, and that's so. These countries that see bats as useful animals don't have that same. Uh, automatic fear as we do in, in other areas. 
Interestingly, I, I, I was reading that only four out of something like 580 species of bats actually use, um, uh, use blood as their main source or their only source of, of sustenance. So mm -hmm. we, we have this vampire um, mythology that goes throughout. And I must admit, you know, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I, I guess a lot of people who are brought up with the vampire mythology um, in their culture will not be aware that a lot of bats do not suck blood. Well, and the, the vampire bats that do drink blood actually is so much less romantic than the vampire movies because typically they just wait and they scratch the animal and they lap up, lap up the blood. They don't suck it, they lap it up and then they'll leave and they will actually save some of their blood meal for the other members of their colony that haven't had a chance to eat. So it's, it's much less... Um, swoop in and attack and drink and it's much more you know waddle over and lick and then go home <laughs> it's, it's a lot less scary if you would if you uh envision the reality as opposed to the, the mythology it's almost like we uh we put we put out there what we would do as humans or we what we think other humans would do and we super in that impose that on the animal i just said you don't think it's you know in some ways it's even sort of um simpler than that in the, as humans, we like to scare ourselves and we like to tell tales that are scary and, and you know, and bats and owls are, you know, to a, a, a large extent unknown. That, that being of the night is the mysterious. That's where the spooky things happen. Um, you know, and, and again, it's how, you know, how you brought up. So for, for my personal example, my mum is, is um, quite nervous. She's scared of birds. She's certainly scared of bats. Um, you know, got into a lot of trouble laughing hysterically when she was trying to, to ride a bike and stay on and keep the bats out of her hair when we were, you know, when we were children. Um, yeah, um, but my, you know, for my dad, absolutely you know, that love of nature and wanting to be out there. So that fascination of, you know, when we were out, you know, out and camping and, and being by a lake and seeing the bats coming to feed. So I think it's some of it is just, we like telling st um, stories to scare ourselves they at the moment they focus around halloween and i think yeah they, we, we just don't know about them there's been a slight change with bats in terms of their usefulness um as again very anthropocentric but human friends in that they the in terms of the number of insects they they catch whether that you know some of them will be useful pollinators but others won't um and I, I just think it's the, I, sometimes I think it's that unknown and I, I like to be scared and, st you know, you know, tell the spooky tales. Um, and yeah, it, we just don't know. It's interesting with social media though, how that's changed things. For example, um, I was reading the other day about black cats are no longer popular, not because of any um, idea that uh, they have any evil inside them, but because they're not very good for selfies. And just going on to spiders, I mean, uh, social social media is amazing, isn't it? You, you, you find things on there that you, you, you never even thought existed. So I found, uh, I found this um, Facebook page, Ophelia the Monster, and it was about a jumping spider. So spiders for me were always, uh, my mum didn't like them. So therefore, you know, I was brought up in, a, in a, an environment where they were not liked. So I grew up not liking them, um, you know, creepy, etc etc they do crawl very ooh, they make shudder some of them though but not all so these jumping spiders they're absolutely amazing and they're kind of almost i don't know if it's the right word but furry so the little mandibles are all furry and they've got these eyes these amazing eyes all around the front and you, you would say they don't look like spiders so social media is helping us to see these animals that traditionally like halloween would have made of us, us scared of and we would have kept up the traditions because it just, you know, it's, it's cultural, isn't it? Uh, but now it gives us the opportunity to actually see um, another side. So wanting to take photos and be kind of internet famous or whatever is actually helping animals in, in many ways, possibly more. I wonder if it's what you said though about them looking fuzzy that helps and the big eyes, you know, the neonous eyes and the, the fuzziness, if it was a-, a Black Widow. A, yeah, Black Widow or a, a you know a very um, armored looking spider. I don't think you'd have the same necessary necessarily reaction to it as you would yeah. the cute little big eyed fuzzy spider. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it, you're absolutely right. Uh, I saw a video of one guy, he put a recluse spider on his face um, and, and deliberately was bitten by it because he wanted to prove to people that it was actually the bacteria in the bite that creates the necrotic um, damage, not the actual bite from the spider. And he goes through this and he, and he videos it and he videos his recovery and uh, absolutely amazing. He didn't get anything for about, I think he like five days. He had a, a, red, a wet, red welt. He even had the, the track marks up the arm, but he took some topical antibiotics and, and that was fine. And then, but then he got himself deliberately bitten by a black widow. And he, he said he's not getting bitten by anything else again after that because that was pretty nasty. But the black widow is that is that that look of a spider that just and the way that they move, it's almost like they it be I don't know if there's any studies done, but it's like they move really slowly and deliberately and apparently they're not aggressive at all, but they're nothing like, as you say, the 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 fuzzy spiders, the fuzzy cute teddy bear looking spiders that right. uh, and there seems to be a whole push, I mean, for conservationists to uh, sort of change this image. Uh, there, I was I was reading about uh, educational facilities and how when they represent these species, they represent them in a way that actually can create more fear. You know, bats and spiders, the way that they have the, the statues around or the way um, people interact with the educational, um, you know, like one had a big bat head on the wall that you could like stick your head in. Well, that's, you know, perpetuating this myth of danger. And there's this movement now to make these creatures accessible. And when you're um, making a logo, you know, making the eyes bigger and making uh, making it more approachable um, has, has really gone far in, in education. And one of the one of the uh, books that I was reading is called Bat, Bat Sing and Mice Giggle. And they were talking about how things that we don't ever share. And that's that, that bats, first of all, we never think about bats nursing. But bats, of course, when they nurse, they cuddle, they cuddle their babies. Um, and they, they sing and their babies actually babble. So they try to make adult noises. So they will be, you know, much like a human being cuddled and, and babbling while they nurse. And so there's sort of this... Uh, attempt to bring out these stories and, and take over the narrative, as it were, like with the fuzzy cute spiders on the internet. You know, we have to be changing this narrative in a way that can help the, the animal as opposed to harming the animal or make, making people afraid. But we do have to be really careful in how we represent things as we educate people. Uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And how that plays out because you know, if we think about, we were you know, talking with owls and with, with cats around Halloween, we kind of, we know more there and, you know, and, and Jimmy's research, so planned research sounds really interesting. And I think for me, if, I, if you think about the classic Halloween cat, it is a cat that is in some sort of um, form of distress. It's got the ar arch back, the fluffed up tail, hackles are up, and it's normally portrayed as spitting. Um, and, it, you know, that, even though we know them, we still don't respect what actually what it, that's all about. It's still seen as that that kind of evilness is there. And I was wondering with, with Jimmy's research that kind of even if people are reading or the information is to help people read owls, if that's the right word to use. For me, I think it's that because owls are quite, uh, uh, they, they appear a bit like cats, a little bit distant, a bit inscrutable. And I'm wondering whether people would always try to get a response from an owl, even if it's just to move its head. It's that's the whether that you know that that comes across. Yeah, definitely. There's, I mean, funnily enough, one of the one of the videos that I looked at, uh, well, many videos on behaviour in owls, is there's a one that was filmed in Japan, um, and it's called Robot Owl, and essentially they. They show these two, it's a white faced owl, which is a small species. Um, and they show uh, two poses uh, the, uh, one where it goes very thin, which is essentially trying to camouflage it. So it, so it literally takes, goes from being a fairly round, rotund, plump owl to super thin, eyes shut, feather tufts up. Um, and then it, that's basically it seen potentially a predator that it wants to hide from. Um, and then the next phase of it is it go is that it sees a predator that it obviously wants to try and scare off. So it's that big face, or basically it opens up all its features, its wings come out to make it as big as possible. 
Now, a lot of people, and I've seen this done with owls in the UK, will will do that. They will, I don't know, get a dog to walk up to the to the owl to make the owl do it, and they're doing it to show off. You know the the features, and people laugh, and you can hear them in the background laughing when actually the owl obviously is clearly distressed at the situation. So yeah, the, I think there's always going to be that issue that people even they don't actually understand what they're looking at or want to understand what they're looking at because they want to get that picture or that whatever yeah, whatever yeah, it is, yeah. is they're doing it so yeah i think there's always that risk that that yeah you you as, as much research and as much as you try and help people understand then they're, they're not going to not going to want to it was quite interesting just listening to you talk then i was thinking about obviously popular culture as well so you know that could be all sorts of things so if we talk about owls you know the wisdom in owls i mentioned the greeks but actually for me growing up one of the things that was taught why i thought owls were wise was winnie the pooh so you know winnie pooh always went to the wise owl in the big tree to to for advice um but interestingly then and it was something i never used to really like and still don't was when you'd watch a, a, a flying display with captive owls, you'd invariably get someone say, oh, well, owls, you know, people think owls are wise, you know, but actually they're thick uh, because they've got these big eyes and a tiny brain. Well, really, it, that's that's rubbish as well because an owl is very good at being an owl and doing what an owl does. A crow is very good at solving problems. A parrot is very good at solving problems. That's why they have higher cognitive abilities an owl is very good at catching a mouse in the dark, in complete darkness, you know, bit pitch black. So, so yeah, it's interesting, the narrative you were just mentioning that people people put on these animals and, and how popular culture makes us perceive these, you know, these these uh, different animals. Uh, yeah, so to carry on what you, you were commenting on, Jimmy, and going back to what Lisa was saying about the classic um, scaredy cat shape or how I remember first seeing it as a Halloween cat shape because this is what children are presented with from a young age that the classic black cat in that um, um, basically a, a fear pose to so the ar the arch back um, and I wonder what that's actually teaching children about animal behavior um, and I give you one example when my, my nephews were younger um, and they came to, to visit and I, I had two cats which uh, they're they're not used to children they, they they don't like children children terrify them um, and the younger one was sort of running up to, to my black cat and she was like, no, stay away from me. And then she was doing the classical um, scared cat pose or arch back, the Halloween cat, essentially. And, and my nephew was, oh, look, she's doing the Halloween cat. And, and at this point, I'm sort of like, yeah, just just let them get used to you being here. But that's that, that instant recognize, um, recognition of, of that classic shape. It, it's the Halloween cat. Um, and, and I wonder sort of, yeah, how, what, what that is sort of teaching children about animal behavior and if that's good or bad or just harmless fun. I'm, I don't know what you think, um, Lisa. Um, um, I, think it's, I think it's very, it's quite harmful because I've heard, I've heard it um, being referred to as, um, particularly with feral kittens, as popcorn kittens because they also make that <laughs> rather than spitting. And it's an absolute fear response. You know, so these tiny, tiny kittens that have no positive association with people, um, you know, and, and and yeah, people people find it funny because it's it's not perceived as a threat because this tiny little scrap of fur is desperately trying to get you to go away. Um, and yeah, it's it, it has absolute, you know, negative things. And I, I think it was a, um, Sarah mentioned um, a while back about the masks. And I don't know um, if anybody uses TikTok. Clearly, it's not aimed at my generation. Um, but there was a there were there have been some horrible um, viral uh, crazes that have gone by challenges that have gone viral on there involving animals this year. And I, I, and clearly, lockdown wherever you are hasn't helped. And one of them was um, people were just supposed to do a zombie dance. And I won't even try, but it was basically um, appear in front of the animal with your head down and your, your arms out at an angle. And then everything would move in a very jerky fashion and you jump towards them to, to video and, sh and, sh and share on TikTok. Hmm. 
Um, and some of those, you know, the people that they, they found it hilarious and in the whole range of animals, absolutely petrified. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it doesn't. It, it's we just we 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 either miss it or we think it's funny and it's more valuable to be on social media. I'm using a big we there. <laughs> Some, um, something else as well that we do and we think is funny and is probably less obvious to be harmful to the animal is dressing them up. Um, I was having a look at um, the top. They, so this is the National Retail Federation, which it says it's global, but I think it's just referring to America um, in, in its figures here. So the top, the top Halloween costumes for pets are pumpkin, hot dog, superhero, bumblebee, cat, witch, lion, dog, devil, shark. And there are millions of animals um, that are dressed up every year. I'll try and find the, the figure in a minute. Um, do you want to go ahead, Michelle, while I try and find that figure? I was going to say, and it relates to the costumes as well. I mean, I think it's getting worse during lockdowns and quarantines because it's a control issue. You know, if we um, are in a situation where our entire life is out of control, you try to get that control where you can. And I think uh, taking some power over scaring another animal or some of the TikTok videos are, the, there's children involved too, where they're the ch they're scaring their children. Um, or back to the, or the, you know, when Jimmy Kimmel does the, I think it's Jimmy Kimmel does the, uh, I eat all your Halloween candy thing. Maybe that's just here in the US, but they go and the parents, they, the parents tell their children, I eat all your Halloween candy to get a negative response from the children and it makes the children cry. And, and I'm just, it's on that same mentality. You know, why is it that we feel this need to, to do cruel things to sort of take control of our situation? And, and I wonder if, if dressing up our, our animals is sort of that same thing. You know, we want them, we want them to be our animals, our children, our possessions. It's partly the, the commercial side there isn't it again so halloween has changed massively since i was a child so if you know if i was if i would ever dressed up for a child's party for halloween it would have been a bin bag or a sheet so that would have been the you know homemade extent of our, our kind of costume it certainly wouldn't ne would never have been um or well, yeah, i suppose maybe some sheets to be bandages to be a mummy or something but never to be buying multiple multiple really you know tacky and, and things and certainly not for the animals so it, it it certainly for me it links in with the whole um how commercial everything's become but okay. the money to be made off of off companion animals as well it, it kind of links in it's just to make you know it's it, you, it brings it back around but very little consideration given to the animals say any agency or saying it at all that they have none 31 million people will buy per pet costumes this year that's 31 million animals that's uh, that that is an uh, that is a lot of animals under some kind of duress but just um i just want to bring in this paper that um, Sam um professor samantha hearn um published the other day or it came through on my email anyway so i had to read of it um and she talks there about um how clothing animals is in many respects an anthropomorphic action um and it's often done to uh for co comedic effect and so we're, we're doing this and it goes back to what you're saying, Chris, what are we teaching people? What are we teaching kids? Um, I saw, a, I, I saw, a, I mean, in terms of like, are they uncomfortable? Are they unhappy? How heavy is it? Uh, the reactions that people give to the animals. I mean, we don't think about that necessarily, you know, somebody pointing at me, why are you pointing at me? But I saw um, on another level, I saw a sheep dressed up um, with an orange tutu on and a little kid in a witch outfit that, um, pulling it around or it following. Um, and I was thinking, on the one hand, they're, you know, they, these kids are probably going to eat sheep. And on the other hand, they're dressed up. So there's no subjectivity given to that animal at all. You know, on, on the one hand, it was, used, it was used for entertainment and very likely going to be used for, for food within our society. I find that we seem to have lost all, all ability in some cases to give any um, empathy to the animals whatsoever. Right. Would you think the opposite would, would be happening? You would think with all of the studying that people are doing about animal behavior and animal cognition, that there would be a positive change rather than a negative one, like we're seeing. I think for me, there's a, an interesting part here and it, it seems to be a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a clash. So, uh, you know, I was asking, um, just, <laughs> discussing on Facebook as you do, 
uh, people, uh, and these were veterinary technicians. So I'm, you know, I'm a, a registered veterinary nurse in the UK. Um, and they were all sharing their um, family Christmas portraits, which seems to be a big thing. Um, and it was really important that their companion animals were in the portraits with them, you know, large and small and, and preferably dressed up to match the rest of the family. And I just find that interesting that the, the, the emotional side, that recognition that their family is there and yet that these animals, you know, were being then, you know, almost forced into these costumes. And, you know, and just sort of saying that cat looks really, oh, yeah, but it was, it was only for a moment. They're fine. And I just find that kind of clash between family. They need to be in our this year. This is our year image. You know, this is our family this year. And yeah. You know, I, I suppose it was probably done to me as a child and, you know, family <laughs> weddings forced to wear an outfit I really hated, but. That's what I was thinking is you sort of force your children for those photos too. My kids yeah. did not want to wear those matching outfits and have their hair done for the photo <laughs> and neither did my dog. So. And, and going back to this paper as well, uh, Professor Hearn says, uh, that is a means of controlling animal nature to civilize, to put clothes on the animal, which is to get rid of the animality, which goes back to what you're saying about um, about animals in family photos. You know, you are you now are part of the family, therefore you have to be more human-like, therefore you, you have to actually put some clothes on you so you are no longer just an animal. I, I think for me, and again with that with the veterinary background, I think the... There's a difference, there's an interest there that you know to explore is that sometimes you need uh, animals to wear things to protect surgical wounds or to protect it from self trauma. Um, and it ties in with, with what Jimmy was saying about how people view owls because I think it's it says more about the people because cats have the same thing oh, you can't train a cat, you know, and, and actually you can. You know, there's a great book by um, uh, Bradshaw and Ellis, The Trainable Cat. And it would be a great thing if people were doing that with kittens, you know, if they have them as kittens to really explore. And they, they have um, a process, you know, they have a, um, a process in there and, and then thinking about it. So they would they mention about a collar, but they, you know, then stepping it up to a harness. Um, and actually, if you, you're thinking about if that's what you want, if you'd like to dress your cat up, how about doing it in a really, you know, a fun way that involves um, some rewards and something as well? And it may then have a really, you know, a benefit for the cat if at some point it needs, you know, it needs surgery or, um, and it's, you know, the first time it hasn't been forced into something is, is a, a hot dog. I've no idea what a hot dog costume would look like, but it's, yeah, there. Um, and they, so, um, yeah, Bradshaw and Ellis just say, so they have, a, they key skills. And their second one is gently, gently, one sense at a time. Uh, systematic desensitization and counter conditioning and that's you know and, and you just think how many people would rush in with a new costume and it's just thrown on the dog or the cat in this case so I think it for me there's that you know and that would happen post-surgery it's just that there's always a kind of our um our timing our need isn't it rather than from the animal's point of view but yeah Jimmy I'm with I'm with you when people say that, you know, owls are thick, they do the same with cats. So yeah, you can't, you can't train them. And especially when they can only, um, they can only uh, cool down through their, you know, through in, in certain fashions, you know, well, in, with their, by panting, for example. So put this big outfit on a, on a, on a dog or a cat and then, and then suddenly they're, they're put in a position where they're, they're just, you know, they become uncomfortable, maybe hmm. in, in, and danger in, in, in many ways. Maybe people, I don't know. I mean, do you hear of that through your work in the Cat Protection League, animals getting injured by costumes? Um, they, if left unattended, um, collars are problematic, um, but there, it would tend to be that it's, yeah, it's, it's just the, the stress of the nerve. It's more often it's people getting injured by trying to force the cat into them. Um, but if the cat's in them, yeah, as, as someone was saying before, the, you know, the hilarity of a cat, you know, not being able, you know, not being the normal graceful cat because they can't, the way that they're walking is clearly encumbered and, and that, that's where the, that's where the amusement is found. Um, and often with a, you know, a very daft soundtrack as well. Um, do, you think, do you think it has anything to do with, like what Jimmy was saying about 
approaching with a dog to get that fear response. Do you think that part of it is because it's harder to read the emotions of a cat or an owl or a bat, but we understand fear. We understand fear, we understand um, discomfort. They're easier to read than pleasure in an owl. So maybe we, we trigger the response that we can understand. And it, you know, if we, if we learn to trigger pleasure in an owl, maybe, maybe we would understand them better and we could approach them in that way. But I think it's just humans, we get that, you know, same with tapping on the windows at the zoo or, you know, we want that, that fear response because we understand that. Yeah, I agree with that, Michelle, definitely. No, sorry, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. It's, it, I think, just listening to, you know, the chat about costumes, I can't really comment too much. I have, interestingly, I have seen people put, like, little daft hats on on tops of owls for a photo. Um, yeah, uh, but that's another argument I've had. Um, but, yeah, de definitely, I think it it's, comes down to... For instance, an owl, it's, it's people don't understand or take the time to understand the ecology and the behaviour of, of that individual animal. So in my case, my interest, it's, it's owls. And obviously owls naturally are very stationary creatures. In, but they're stationary during our, our period that we're most active. So most, most owls are predominantly nocturnal or crepuscular. Um, when we're active so you put an owl in that situation whether it's hand reared captive bred or whatever and it's just going to sit there really um, and and so yeah trying, trying to get that sort of reaction or that that that's something to show off um, is, is definitely I think that's definitely a large a large part of it and it's probably the same with with the listening to you talk about the the, the sort of costumes in cats and and, and animals is we don't actually, and it's probably the same for humans, really, talking about mental health. We don't, a lot of people don't understand it and they, or they don't want to or they, they're not interested in understanding what's not, what's going on underneath the surface, basically, of the, the, of the animal, yeah. I think, just to add, I, I think as humans, we're needy. And we just want the animals to recognize us and give us something. And, you know, with cats, they don't always, do they? They're, they're, they, they do their own thing. So if you can get a response, similar as Jimmy was saying with, with, with the owls, I, I, I think it's all about us wanting the animals to, to, to respond and, 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 for want of a better word, perform for us. Yeah, we want to be entertained. We want to be entertained by so many different animals, don't we? You know, it's like, oh, oh, look at that, you know, and then we don't give it a second thought once that, you know, we've been with that animal for five, ten minutes, maybe half an hour, and then it's, you know, we just go on for the next thing. Um, I don't Isn't know. like when you're riding in the car with your siblings, though, and your sibling's quietly reading a book in the car. What do you have to do? You have to poke your sibling. You have to do it because you want a response. We don't... We don't do well when people are not paying attention to us. And so by poking and prodding our animals and yeah, we're, we're getting a response out, we're getting them to notice us. Does anybody know much about the psychology of that? I don't, I don't. No, maybe for another time. So going back to, to when I adopted my black cat um, from a shelter in the US um, 16 years ago now, um, <clears throat> We took her home in October, but the, the shelter said they, they had a policy of not adopting out black cats in the weeks running up to Halloween. Um, they let, her, let us take her home in the end, um, I guess, because pragmatically um, the cats, the cats were needed, needed rehoming. Um, and also we had another non-black cat. Um, and at first I thought it was um, um, the sort of fear that comes up every year that black cats are used in satanic rituals, etc. Um, but actually they said they didn't ad adopt them out because they, they feared that people were wanting to adopt them for accessories. So either as a black cat to go with your witch's outfit or to take um, cute pictures with pumpkins. Um, and I did take a super cute picture of her as a, as a kitten with a pumpkin. Um, I did do that. <laughs> but yeah, and going back to what you were saying earlier, Sarah, about this push towards adopting black cats by um, trying to promote them as being more photogenic and, and that 
that actually really sort of surprises me that 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 is a concern or a factor that comes in when you're looking to adopt a cat. It's like, I don't want a black cat because they won't look good. Or I want one for Halloween because they'll look great with a pumpkin. Um, it's a positive on materialistic world though, isn't it? You know, we're, we're, we're made to, we're bombarded with fashion uh, over and over again and the latest gadget and the latest this and the latest that. I mean, we, basically we've been brainwashed into into wanting, you know, the, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, because obviously it earns more money. So um, I, I can see why we we can we do the same with animals. I, I don't know how to turn that off in a capitalist society. I don't think that, because I don't think anybody wants to turn it off, you know. I was oh, thinking, I that, sorry, I was, just, I was just thinking about the costumes that are sold. Maybe that should be considered abuse. Then I was thinking, who doesn't want to, you know, they're not going to not sell 28 million costumes. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of jobs. You just made me think of when, you know, if you follow the the breed sales, like in the United States, when the, the 101 Dalmatians movie came out, the live action movie, sales of Dalmatians went through the roof and it actually ended up um, ruining the genetics of the breed because so many people wanted to own this Dalmatian. I mean, it was the newest thing. And I guess that if you go back and read the breed books, this happens every time you know, a new kind of movie comes out that, that features, you know, when Lassie was popular and everybody wanted a collie. And yeah, I guess it happens all of the time when you have a movie, people want the latest fashion accessory, which in this case is a particular breed of dog. Meerkats in the UK, apparently, because of the UK advert with meerkats, uh, the, the insurance advert. That again, that, that's in this paper. And um, also uh, the Harry Potter, but what, the, is it Barn Owls in the Harry Potter movie, Jimmy? Uh, yeah, well, there's a few. There's a few, but Hedwig is a snowy owl. Yeah, oh. so which is probably one of the the, the worst. Not that I'm <laughs> condoning going out, but snowy owls. You couldn't really pick a worse species to to have as a an owl, as a pet as a pet or as a. But yeah, it's interesting. There was a paper. There was a paper done by a Dutch ornithologist, off the top of my head, um, saying that the ha the Harry Potter effect, the impact that that had on wild owls and it didn't have obviously abroad from from the uk um it didn't have too much of an impact on on wild owls but yeah definitely i've i've certainly um seen uh, over the unfortunately in the uk anyone can own a bird of prey so it's actually the polar opposite to say michelle in, in the states where they have really strict um licensing on on the ownership of birds of prey in the uk you can go out and buy a barn owl for as little as 50 quid um and uh, sadly there are people out there that will will sell them um to you and and yeah i i remember writing a, a blog post a while ago that got a lot of traction called um all about poke i call them poke and strokes and you'll have seen you know and owls are the biggest ones that fall um victim to this because of obviously people are drawn towards owls that is, I've already mentioned about the big eyes and the round face and, and all the rest of it um, and so yeah people are using them for it might be you know events like Harry Potter you know I know I know people now I talked about you know Halloween photo shoots at the moment come and have your picture taken but I know other people who do um, themed experience days where the kids come dressed up as, as you know, a, a wizard or a, a, you know, a character from Harry Potter and fly the owl. So obviously people are, are, are playing on the back of, of, um, of these, these sort of films and, and yeah, definitely Harry Potter supposedly rescue centers. And I think a lot of it's anecdotal anecdotal um, evidence have, have said that they saw a rise in, in owls, you know, coming into rescues after the Harry Potter films. Because what, what tends to happen with owls, a lot of people get them as, as little balls of fluff, um, you know, cute, cuddly things, like a Furby uh, sort of thing. Um, and then some takes a species like the European eagle owl, which is arguably the largest owl in the world. So it stands, you know, three foot tall. And um, well, uh, they can they can go from a two week old ball of fluff like this to fully grown in twelve weeks tops. So that's a big growth spurt. And so yeah, a lot of then you've got a very big powerful owl um, that you've got to to deal with. So 
so yeah, it, 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 I've no doubt Harry Potter adds something to answer. I was going to say, I just heard the same with Rat. When when you were talking about films, I'd heard a similar thing with Ratatouille. That when the film Ratatouille was out, that loads of people bought rats and wanted pet rats became the new thing. So yeah. Anyway, do you see trends, Lisa? We do. Um, and I suppose sticking with Harry Potter, the um, Hermione Granger's cat in Harry Potter was Crookshanks, um, and a representation of a Persian, so a brachycephalic breed. Um, and thankfully, there didn't seem to be um, any particular correlation with their with um, their popularity. Um, but with cats, it tends to be uh, again celebrities and social media. So um, where uh, Taylor Swift and I think Ed Sheeran had Scottish folds, um, you know, people searching for them went up um, and uh, which is problematic because of the uh, inherent health problems with them and the, the cartilage um, congenital or inherited condition. Um, and then it's also, um, again, the aesthetics, the, uh, the hybrids, the Bengals, that yeah. wildness. So you want your domestic cat, but you want that the, the, the wild crosses, the hybrid, because they're and then they are, you know, aesthetically, they are stunning. And it, I, again, with the eagle owls, I can imagine they're just, you know, they are beautiful creatures. But in terms, can we meet their needs? Should we, you know, should they be in a, you know, it, it, I don't know, it, there's no such thing as an average home, is there? Um, but, you know, with, with Bengals, the beautiful but you know potentially really po problematic for other cats in the neighborhood if they're outside if they're allowed to you know to go outside and the wildlife and then about their own needs and their own welfare if they're kept confined so you know it, it, it yeah it, it tends to be uh, a lot of it's celebrity driven with with cats but on the the black cats um it, cats protection has run the uh, the national black cat uh, day for, for 10 years now um, and uh, the, 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 we're finding that black cats spend less time in care than they did 10 years ago, which is amazing. Um, so they, there's a lot to sort of promote it. So again, it's, uh, there's, if you search for, if you're on Twitter, uh, hash, uh, hashtag black cat day, there's always lots going on if people uh, like following cat stuff. Um, I know one year they did um, 50 shades of black and there was all the, the cat colours were named, so Sirius Black, again, a, another Harry Potter uh, reference. Um, and it's sort of really that taking it on about, you know, that sympathy about the cats not want, you know, people not wanting black cats and kind of really um, lifting them up. And, and a similar thing is done with black dogs as well. Yes. But they are, you know, they're just to, to boost them, really. Um, but yes, I think last year it was uh, cat, black cats took only two more days than average to find a home than cats of a, 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 any other persuasion. That's really good. Well, in, the, in shelters, you know, the big black dog syndrome, that they don't get adopted as quickly. And one of the ways that shelters have found around that is by doing something to make them special. So calling them a specialty breed, oh yes, this dog is part lab, part Sharpay. You know, because it's a it's a big black wrinkly dog, and then suddenly it gets adopted, or you know, oh no, this dog is a is a you know some some special name that they'll call the big black dogs just so that they can get them adopted because people want something special. They want an accessory. They don't necessarily want um, you know a, a, a ragged black dog. Chris, were you saying something about moral panic and black cats um, before the show? Yeah, so I mean, you, you see it in social media every time this year, sort of coming up, telling people to keep their cats and their black cats indoors because um, um, people will target them for abuse because of superstition. Um, and the, there's the rumours that come up about satanic um, rituals, um, people taking black cats for that. Um, and yeah, I, I, I mean, the yeah, so, so, so I thought it'd be kind of cool if we could talk a little bit about moral panic and how much of that is. So, so I see mo so moral panic is um, a widespread feeling of fear. It's basically a panic. It's of, often based in some kernel of truth. So um, a couple of incidents are reported and then it gets taken over by the media and suddenly, um, yeah, everybody is 
panicking about it and thinks that the problem is a lot bigger than it is. Um, and um, in the case of black cats, I don't know if that's actually good or bad. Um, well, aren't we seeing that right now with the bats and the coronavirus that, mm. that here's this uh, species that we either don't think a lot about or we only think about once a year that suddenly is in the spotlight and being blamed for, for viruses, which is not, um, it's not unwarranted. I mean, 53% of the emerging diseases in Africa, and I have the, I was looking up statistics between 96 and 2009, 53% of the emerging disease outbreaks in Africa came from bats, okay? So bats are actually, they have a, a multitude of microbes um, and they don't affect a lot of people, but when people are affected, it's really bad, if that makes sense. So, so they are because of we, inter we interfere with them. Yes, so that's the problem is that um, what's happening is people get afraid of bats and kill the bats. When in reality, the issue is that bats have adapted very well to humanity living in their areas and, and have become um, accustomed to living with people. And what that does is set up this, this human bat interaction, um, which then leads to when something like this happens, which is humanity's fault for being in bat areas and taking over bat areas. Um, in response, we start killing off all the bats and burning all the bats, um, when in fact bats are so very useful you know, to us. So in this case, this is a, a, an example of a moral panic where it's potentially bad for the animal. They're becoming um, potential targets for, um, for, for culling and, um, uh, yeah. And as I'm, I'm thinking of a, a similar example I was reading um, a, a while back. So Jess Groling, Groling's PhD um, on um, urban foxes and some of the, the moral panic surrounding with how the media was reporting them. So a couple of um, reported cases of foxes um, actually biting people. Um, but then that gets blown out of proportion and people sort of start panicking. And, and then that can potentially feed back on real life animals that they're then persecuted. Um, um, so so this, this so, so the, these examples where it, this is really bad for the animal, it has real life consequences. Um, but going back to the, the moral panic over black cats being targets of um, superstition around Halloween. Um, and I, I, yeah, I don't know if drawing attention to potentially these things happening is, is um, a, a good or a bad thing. I mean, there's probably no harm in just keeping an extra eye on your cat during the holiday. Um, but potentially it's bad if your cat's normally roaming outside every day and then beginning of October you're like no you can't go out you have to stay in and, and a cat that's not used to being confined that um, potentially is, is bad for the, the mental health of the cat um, if, if part of the problem isn't just if your cat is out on Halloween night it's more likely to run into people because there are more people out on Halloween yeah. so maybe it's just a matter of there being more opportunities for people to do bad things as opposed to there actually being a more intent. I think in, in the UK, um, Halloween is in close proximity to um, a bonfire night, um, which um, in some places is traditionally an excuse to let off lots of fireworks. Um, and that often, the use of fireworks often then extends around Halloween as well. So some of the concern would be that, that actually, you know, it, um, trick or treat is, is not such a huge thing in the UK in terms of numbers um, but the, 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 the use of fireworks and, and that the, the potential then for a cat to be scared is what is you know is, is there um, and then also that um, often similar time scale to Diwali a game with lots of firecrackers used to celebrate and it just becomes an auditory you know um, bombardment if, if you like so the, the risk I is that is there for me for um, cats wildlife any animal that has no idea what, what the human activity is you know is, is around hello Kathy welcome back we're actually just talking about um, black cats um, in Halloween and um, I, I wonder how how are black cats um, viewed in Italy um, in relation to Halloween Yes, well, those are 
three different words that I've been investigating in the last week or so, Halloween, uh, black, and cat. So I don't know what uh, you all talked about earlier, but um, in Italy, the ca- I learned recently that the Catholic Church views Halloween as a big no-no. So um, there's a popular uh, Halloween, uh, the commercialized version for kids, and students that uh, participate in Halloween costume wearing and, and such things. But at, uh, uh, traditionally, um, because of the Catholic view, um, I was told Christian, but I'm sure that's not true, um, that uh, the, uh, making fun of death at Halloween uh, is, is, is like sacrilege. So um, it's not taught to the school children, Halloween festivities and the history and fun activities and things like that are not done at school. Sometimes, um, sometimes uh, uh, in the classroom activities, they might add an Italian version to where the pumpkin comes from or, um, but they won't talk about black cats and things like that and ghosts and ghoulies. <laughs> So I spoke with a friend of mine who's a, a, a school teacher. So I asked her about this and she had taught in a Catholic elementary school. And so I got to ask her about um, policies and in the school structure. But she did say that because of um, Halloween arrived in Italy in the mid 1990s, I was here then and it was uh, very controversial. It still is uh, as a uh, as a, as a festivity and uh, black cats actually are more seen not as a s- emblem of Halloween, but as an emblem of the traditional witches from medieval times, the scary witch. So that probably has something to do also with the figure of the cat lady, the famous cat lady. <laughs> lady. Here in Italy, it's a no kill country since the early 1990s. Um, so uh, 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 euthanization of, of cats in general cannot happen unless there's a strictly medical reason. So um, just because I don't like your coat color or you're scratching my furniture and I will take you to be euthanized does not happen here. Um, And I wanted to get back to black cats. Uh, (laughs) So uh, I had a lovely picture of my black cat sitting with a pumpkin that I just bought. And then my gray long hair cat took his position and I took two pictures. So um, and when you see Leo, the black cat, you just think Halloween immediately. When you see the other cat, the gray long, cute, you know, next to the pumpkin, you're just like, oh, a cat near a pumpkin. And that made me think about Stephen Baker and the representation that picturing the beast is where um, uh, I sort of focused on, which is, uh, well, how is it that I felt that way viewing my black cat and my gray cat? How is it that these feelings were so different? You know? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you guys talked about uh, history, representation, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think the three, the three words I'm going to go back to that is Halloween is, a, um, is an issue in Italy. Uh, black and the significance of black, uh, of you know, representing death and evil and negative connotations, uh, and cats, which um, uh, is, I found that um, cats, whether their coat colors are, are, you know, they they do have a preference at the adoption center where I volunteer at. However. Black cats, once real black cats interact with humans, um, they just become cats who are black. So the three themes that I had chosen for today was um, uh, speaking about the representation of the Halloween cat, as uh, Chris had mentioned, you know, the scaredy cat, Um, the black cat, so black and cats, uh, which which uh, is tied historically to the beliefs and superstitions, which has a lot to do with uh, humans reacting to real 
black cats. And the third topic would, would have been the third theme was the real cat, because I did find a wonderful paper that came out, and I will send this through to you, Chris, which is the about the black cat bias. So these psychologists at the University of Texas in uh, 2019 um, uh, published this paper and they're psychologists. And so they went and looked at, uh, uh, at these themes and wondered why black cats remained in the cat shelter and in America, in the United States, um, because long stay cats, unadopted cats uh, are euthanized. Uh, this paper was significant for this reason. So they looked at the uh, potential adopters and they surveyed people, uh, not just students, but um, uh, from about 20 to 35 years old. Uh, and they found that uh, a lot of this, the more superstitious beliefs led to more non-adoption of black cats. And in terms of cat welfare, they, they suggested, well, long-term stay cats uh, are higher at risk in the shelter because they can uh, catch uh, ca cat colds and cat diseases. Okay, Lisa's nodding, yes. Yeah, can... And so um, this was an important paper in that context in the United States for them to publish. Uh, and I was, I just found this a couple of days ago, I just really lucked out. But the whole idea about the black cat bias, I don't know if that was a term that's been used uh, before. Um, and then the real cat, of course, I had this wonderful, uh, I'm sorry that my Screen is frozen. I have this wonderful um, uh, printout of um, the UK feline. I can't remember. It was in Bradshaw and Ellis uh, and Brown, excuse me, uh, of the classic uh, defensive aggressive cat as an, uh, from an ethogram. So the scaredy cat that we see at Halloween time is just one phase, one emotional state of a cat through a process, through in a in a process of of emotions going on, and we just focused on that. And I looked at um, why that why that image of the scaredy cat. Any questions? Yeah, we, we were talking about the the scaredy cat image um, earlier um, when you froze, and yeah, I wonder where where that that image actually originated, um, how it became the iconic um halloween cat um motif well that might be good for an erica fudge or somebody doing historiography of images in cats and stuff because i thought oh let's see if i can you know quickly find the source of that you know historical time where did that image come up I did not find it quickly. So that could be for future research if anybody is interested in tracking down uh, representations of the scaredy cat, that would be a great paper to write. Um, yeah. Kathy, just to say the only, only things that I sort of found were again with the, the link with um, demonic states um, De and that they um, representing of demons or Satan. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's often that kind of uh, more um, jagged outline of a, a silhouette um, is deemed to be would be more representative almost along the lines of I suppose gargoyles um, rather than a, a, a relaxed cat who you know when cats are truly relaxed they can almost look like puddles can't they that if they're so um, so sleepy that a, a, a scaredy cat is far is seen as um, linking back to the witch is familiar and, and just a scare, you know, it is a more threatening um, uh, outline. So a, a kind of carrying on from earlier centuries that's been picked up and then made much more of a cartoon figure for today's Halloween. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, I, um, there were so many angles on this topic to go from, but um, uh, I believe exactly what you said is that in this short brief, you know, research um, that I did was that I believe that uh, because of the familiars and the witches and the connection and the folklore and the superstitions and beliefs, traditional European 
beliefs and something about Irish uh, immigrants taking Halloween festivals over to America, okay, to the United States. Um, and the connection with the, the spiky, puffy, arched back and, you know, uh, cat hairs on. And I believe uh, represents that emotion of fear. So children and we all as human animals, we all can relate to that emotion of fear. And that cat with arched back just displays it so well. It's, you know, very defensive or aggressive. Um, and uh I'm seeing... Just recently, I just quickly looked at some of the, 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 the publicity going on, and I've noted that the, I had a hard time looking for the scary, scary cat for Halloween. They're becoming soft, cuter, and uh, more um, approachable, like what you just described, Lisa, as a cute, cuddly cat. So the black cat of Halloween here, in, in any case, in Italy, and on the internet, I quickly, you know, downloaded... Uh, I just, you know, searched uh, Halloween cats and these images are much cuter. And so I'm wondering if from the 50s and 70s, when the uh, feline ethology did take off with Con uh, Conrad Lawrence and then Paul Lehausen, um, his book on cat behavior got translated into English in the 1970s. Uh, uh, he had written it in, Eng uh, in German in the 1950s. So from the 70s onwards regarding Halloween and the United States, I think that probably the fashionability, you know, the fashion of black and then women, gender issues and post-structural thought and all that kind of stuff, with cat feline ethology coming forward, I think today, 30 years later, we're seeing cute black cats. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a, an interesting link there. So I think if you look at children's literature, cats are, and, it, and again, I, you know, for me, a disconnect from the church. Um, mm -hmm. I, have, I have no religious beliefs, mm -hmm. but it, it, it would appear that cats have become more mysterious or exotic rather than that pure link with evil. And I think in terms of gender studies, if you um, if you are um, a witch finder or mm -hmm. a witch killer and their familiars being the cats, you need to do something to justify why these um, these uh, souls are being tortured and killed. Um, and if you look at the representation of the human uh, witches, mm -hmm. um, virtually all female, they are portrayed as really, really ugly hags. Mm -hmm. And yet research has shown that actually, you know, quite often they were very, um, you know, they would be women that would be deemed to be very attractive, very beautiful, very wanted, and sometimes would have been called out for being a witch for spurning men. Mm -hmm. um, so, in, you know, you, that sort of, that side, that portrayal of witches as always being hideous um, you know, I, I think about some of the, you know, with, with warts and various facial disfigurements. Is, is that the same treatment that's done to the cats that we've made them these sort of possessed creatures that always have the arch back, you know, that are again, it's just a, a, you know, a query there. Uh, the, the, the connection between that, uh, our Luke uh, with somebody else wrote this great photographic book and he mentions this the photographed cat I didn't find any black cat Halloween um, images in there because they chose not to not to go there but um, there is a section about cats and women there's a whole discourse <laughs> right <laughs> um, about uh, objectifying the image of the witch who is mysterious and unknown so a part of this black cat bias in this paper that I mentioned earlier speaks uh, of um, what the color black and cats represent. And uh, because of the role of, I'm just reading this off right now, um, from their introduction, uh, uh, talking about the black cat mm, bias, they say psychologically the color uh, black plays a role in many prejudicial attitudes and superstitious belief systems. Okay, and then they go on uh, to speak about the color of black, but how women are um, 
um, tied into this is because of the witches. And I, I don't know about the hideous witches. We don't get that here. Um, they're uh, empowered, young, winks, sort of like witches. And the black cat is becoming uh, more of an emblem of uh, the women's role, I suppose, in having sort of that mysterious, unmanly, you know, unmaily, um, I want to say powers, but it's not attributes, let's say. Okay. Oh, I do want to make a, a, a lasting point, um, uh, which is that uh, part of the work that we're doing here, I believe, uh, in discussing Halloween animals does go back to Berger, John Berger, and to Stephen Baker, um, because I've been, you know, reading Stephen Baker, about representations and how uh, we uh, bridge from our human imagination through the cultural filters in creating, because we do go and con construct, construct the animal, and how do we bridge this to the real animal, and and that goes in to this work with the black cats at the adoption centers. I think there's a a, a gold mine there, but I would like to leave. The lasting thought would be not the scaredy cat, not the black cat, which is in uh, capital letters, black cat, okay? But the cat who happens to be, the cat who happens to have a black coat, okay? As opposed to red or whatever, ginger or uh, whatever other. Because um, can I add an anecdote? Go ahead. Okay, okay, we're way over time, sorry. Um, when I first started uh, uh, volunteering at the cat shelter here, I'd never worked with cats before, okay? When I first arrived on cleaning shifts, I sort of remember this, you know, jumping back when I saw the black cats in the shelter. We have a colony of about 90 uh, free roaming cats in the structure, okay? And they're separate from the, the, the admitted cats, let's say, you know? So we have our own colony at the shelter. And two years later down the road, uh, I realize, I remember this realization. I went to go and look, I was asked to go and look for a certain cat in our colony. Okay, let's say his name was Giovanni. Okay, and I was, I was asked to go and find Giovanni. I went upstairs into our uh, living room what, in the attic space. It's set up as a house home space for the cats to be. I went up there looking for Giovanni and it occurred to me when I saw 20, I counted them at that moment. It was about 25 black cats in the room. Uh, with, I realized that I did not, I no longer saw just black cats. I was looking for Giovanni. And that struck me because uh, when I first arrived, you know, I, I saw the figure of the black cat and I had this imag uh, imaginary the image of the black cat inside of me from childhood. Thank you very much. Okay, and that's the end of my anecdote. <laughs> cool. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you for watching. Um, until next time. <laughs>